ABC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, virtual family. Welcome to this week's edition of SJC News. Let's all do our part to belong together, to believe together, and to become everything that the kingdom of God needs us to be. This Sunday, we pause to celebrate August wedding anniversaries. Happy anniversary to those who said I do during the August month. May God enrich your union and refresh your love for one another. On August 28th, we will recognize the student scholars of our SJC family. Please keep watch of your emails in anticipation for information from Sister Messiah Williams. September will be a very special month for our SJC family. We will celebrate our 152nd anniversary. We will belong together, believe together, and become one together. Please stay tuned for information on how we will celebrate together. That concludes this week's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the news. Now here's Dunya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made, and I'm great and glad to be alive. I pray that you've had a wonderful weekend, and I thank God for your presence virtually with us on today. We are grateful for how you have decided to give God a chance through this ministry. Thank you so very much. For those who are members of our family, virtually, we are grateful for you tuning in once again. And we pray that this broadcast and this virtual ministry is a blessing to you. I'm Pastor Richard Allen Washington, and I am grateful to serve in the vineyard with the St. John community, and I'm thankful for the wonderful people who present this broadcast, and I'm thankful for the wonderful people who watch it. It is my prayer that you will share this message today with someone who you feel needs to hear what the Word of God says on today. Thank you for your attention. Let's go to God in prayer, and let's hear what the Lord has to say. God, we thank you for this wonderful morning. We are grateful for who you are and for how you've kept us this past week. As we start a brand new week today, we want to invite you in at this moment. Speak to us, God, in a way that you have yet this month. Speak to us, O oh Lord, in a way that will brighten our path and give us the courage to press in the right direction. God, where we need to be convicted, we ask that you do so now. Where we need to be conformed to the image of Christ, we invite you to do the shaping through the preaching of your word. Use this, your servant, for the time that has been set aside. May preparation give way to progress. May study give way now to the strength and the salvation that study has hoped to provide and press, O oh Lord, our buttons in faith that we are stronger by it. Thank you and we love you. In Jesus' righteous name we say, amen. This morning I am so thankful for you and I wanna invite you this morning to turn with me in the Gospel of Mark. Now, St. John, you know, and the virtual community knows that Mark is a favorite of mine. And so I want to invite you to Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, at the B clause of the 24th verse, I want to pick it up from there and just read a few verses from the B clause of verse 24 through, through verse number 34, probably. Let's go to work and see what the Lord has to say for us. And a great crowd followed him. 
and throngs of people were around him. And there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone forth from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched me? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Amen. I wanna to talk today from the subject, a personal encounter with Christ. A personal encounter with Christ. You know, when we walk through these biblical pages of God's holy word, when we walk through any book that describes the journey and the work of Jesus, we can come to understand that people who came to him were in need of him. The biblical narrative and the scriptures outside of biblical narrative point to the fact that anyone who approached Jesus had the tendency to really need something from him. You know, when you read scripture, you can pick up at any place and find that anyone who is searching, lurking and looking for Jesus, the Christ, had a reason to be doing so. When we open the holy word of God in scripture in the gospels, particularly in the gospels, we find people who were in desperate situations, who were at the end of their rope, and who realistically had nowhere else to turn but to God through Jesus. That matter of fact, when you think about it, there was a man who had a daughter who needed to be healed. There was a man who had a son who needed to be healed. They were both at the points of death, the point is. They were desperate and had tried the, the medicine of their day and nothing had worked. There were families who were in need. There were people who came to Jesus who were hungry and needed to be fed. There was one man who was in the same position for 38 years. And when Jesus got to him, he simply said, nobody can put me in. And here we find in this fifth chapter of the gospel of Mark, the fast paced gospel, the quick, short and in a hurry gospel, but the eldest gospel, the gospel that speaks life to every other book of a gospel, the gospel where everyone draws their strength from, the gospel where everyone has an opportunity to hear messages from Jesus, the gospel. This is Mark's gospel, one of my favorites, because it doesn't waste time and it particularly deals with people who are in desperate circumstances. Today, we have a very desperate person. We have a woman who has a particular kind of issue that is dealing with her blood flow. She has a genealogical issue. She has an issue that, that most men cannot comprehend nor understand. She has an issue, a hemorrhage, according to this particular passage of scripture, that, that, that addresses her challenge, yes. For 12 years, according to the book of Mark, for 12 years, this woman has suffered a loss of blood. And it's been so draining for her that the record says that she has spent all that she had trying to discover how she might resolve this hemorrhage. Nothing had worked. 
She's desperate, if you haven't learned that by now. She has went to every particular kind of remedy of the time in which she lived. She tried ancient remedies even, and nothing had given her the relief and the resolve that she needed. She had heard from different people about what it's possible that could stop. You know, let me pause and say that there are some home remedies that, that every now and then when we are tired of paying for Tylenol and Advil and other over-the-counter drugs, we can try some home remedies and often if you give them time, they have a way of working in a way that you and I did not even imagine they could and they have resolved, released, and taken care of the maladies of our bodies and our soul. You know what's strange is this woman tried them and nothing worked for her. She tried every malady, she tried everything that she'd heard, she'd even tried what the doctors prescribe, every now and then doctors, when they are at the end of their rope, they can prescribe something old school. And she'd even tried that. And nothing, according to the word, worked. On one particular day, Mark declares that she had heard the reports and the stories about this man named Jesus. And she decided because of her desperate circumstance that I need to encounter him. Let me pause and invite all of us to look at our desperate circumstances right now and ask a very serious question. Have you chosen to encounter Christ in your desperate situation? Have you chosen to try God through Christ Jesus? while things are not turning out your way? Have you reached the point of desperation and depression where you have tried education and education couldn't do anything for you, it just polished you. Let me say it again, it polished you. You've tried politics and they shifted you from position to position, but they did not resolve your problem. You've attempted to try culture to become more culture, to sound different, to know the do's and the don'ts of the contemporary culture, and it has not afforded you the relief or the opportunity that you are desiring. I wanna encourage you, whatever your desperate needs are, I think there is something to trying to have an encounter with Jesus the Christ that you can learn from. This woman who is desperate who is at the end of her rope, who does not know what else to do, decides to try what she has heard may work. I want to serve notice on you that right now, while the Christian faith is under attack, right now, while, while people are talking about dismantling churches and breaking up fellowships of the faith and not praying in the name of Jesus or in God's name in schools right now where people are attempting to define gender, sexuality, and what it means to be a human. I think that those churches and Christians might do well to say you need an encounter with God through Christ. I, I just believe that while humanity is at its desperate position now, that Jesus might be an encounter humanity needs. You know what, I know too many people who have encountered him on deathbeds, that Jesus has been working on God's behalf and lifted them. I know too many people who have been sick and afflicted in ways that no doctor could resolve or understand, but they tried Jesus. They tried God through Jesus and somehow something clicked in the doctor's head and before it was done, the resolve had come how to treat their malady. Yeah, I, I think that what can help African-Americans, particularly right now, is not just holding tight to the phrase Black Lives Matter. I think what might really help us is to recognize that God through Jesus Christ is still able to resolve what the world, education, and culture cannot. 
I still believe in its power. I still believe the church is the answer to what the world and black Americans need. If the church gave you an education, if the church was where HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities started from, what makes you think the church is, relevant, is irrelevant now and cannot perform God's ministry to God's people through it now? I want to encourage you. Maybe the black community needs to really have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I'm preaching. You just got to pay attention. The text says this woman who has tried everything, like many of us, we tried everything, decides I have heard enough about the reports on him. I'm going to try him for myself. Have you decided that you would try Jesus for yourself? I know this is kind of ancient to some. But there is something special about trying Jesus. I know that many of us don't want to hear it, but I still believe that when you call on the name of God through Jesus, something happens in the atmosphere. Text says she began one day to press her way to him. And in pressing her way to Jesus, according to the text, there was a crowd already around. Why would Mark mention a crowd being around? What's the necessary mentioning of people? I want to pause and speak to you hermeneutically. I got to put a kickstand here. And I want you to understand something, Carrie. I need you to hear this. The text says that a crowd pressed on him so much that it was hard for him to tell who was touching him. But this woman who had a hemorrhage of blood for 12 years pressed through the crowd. That, that, that's first what you need to know. In order to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, you will need to press through people. You will need to press through the crowds and the throngs of individuals who are between you and your breakthrough in God through Christ. You're going to need to pay no attention to them. You're going to have to not be distracted. I want to pause and say that right now that might be what Christians need. Stop being distracted by crowds. Stop being distracted by the cultural isms of the time times. Hold fast and press your way to God through Christ. Right now, enough of you have tried every other opportunity. You've tried everything you know to try. Why don't you press your way to Christ? You've tried it. You ought to come on and try the one who is able You've heard the reports. He woke you up this morning. You've heard the reports. He opened doors for people. You've heard the reports that God will break bridges and build bridges for you. You've heard the reports. He's a way out of no way. You've heard the report. He's a bridge over troubled water. You heard the report. He is a shelter in the times of stormy weather. You've heard the report. He is food when you are hungry. You've heard the report. He is a doctor in sick rooms where no other educated doctor can roam. You've heard the report. He moves in courtrooms that you can never understand. He is beyond the comprehension of the world. He is evil. You've heard the report. When you're going to try him for yourself with what you are in desperate need of? When is the church going to try Jesus and not a bank? When is the church going to try Jesus instead of petty personal preferences? When is the church going to return to God's way of life for God's kingdom through the ways that God has instructed in the lifestyle of Jesus Christ? When are you going to try to give unto the Lord and let the Lord give back unto you? Press down, shaken together and running over. When are you going to cast your bread on the water and watch God bring it back to you in the air? that you need it most when are you gonna try God through Christ and watch him bring your family back together again when are you gonna try him with your talent and know that he will say to you when you offer it servant well done you've been faithful over few I'm gonna give you a promotion that nobody can take from you you want to be promoted try it God's way hear me this morning this woman presses, 
past people. You got to press past people. You know, people will have you going every which way, but the right way. People will tell you how you ought to be, what you ought to do, and give you their perception and perspective. Watch this. Based on their either experience or what they feel. And that is insufficient for your problem. You need to press past people's preferences and push for your personal encounter with Christ. She did it. She pressed. She did it. She pressed. And I need to give you a little history. I need to exegete here. This woman, because of her issue, was cut off from community. Nobody would associate with her because she was considered unclean. Preach, Pastor. That means that people had given up on the fact that she could return. I, I got to serve. No, some of us have been dealing with some stuff for so long. People have given up on our ability to overcome it. Some of us have been the same way, dealing with the same problems for so long. Some of the people that love us have decided you won't be any different and I'm done. I've come to tell you, she gets it. She's been put on the outside of the circumstances of the community because of her hemorrhage. Have you ever been discontinued in the community because you have an issue that lasts longer than the patience of the people who say they love you? Preach, Pastor. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. You've been trying to deal with it. You've been trying to overcome it. Preach. You've been trying to, to navigate your way. You've been broke longer than you want. You've been dealing with less longer than you prefer. You're tired of asking for help. You know what? Let me pause. There's some people that say, I'm tired of so-and-so asking for help. There are parents, watch this, who say, I wish my children would get their lives in order so that they could stop draining my wallet. Come here for a minute, parent. Come here for a minute, child. While it did not take you as long to get yourself together, who are you to suggest that your child will never get it together because the time frame that they have been walking and wrestling and trying to overcome is different than yours? Preach, Pastor. What am I saying? You still, parent, have stuff to get in order with God. And God has yet to cut you off. God has yet to stop filling your needs on a daily basis. Yes. This is what bothers me in communities. We all don't have the same struggle. We can't. We all don't have the same vice. We should not. We all aren't good at the same thing. And when you discover a weakness and a weariness and a frailty, fragility in someone, be godly enough to be patient with them because God is patient with you. Whew. Some of us need to be convicted right here. You are a part of the crowd that has given up and pushed that individual out of the hope that they will one day be different. This woman has to press in spite of the crowds that have put her out of community. And she does it, watch this, not caring what they think. Maybe that's the difference between you and your personal encounter. You have got to get to a place in your mind, watch this, in my mind, you got to get to a place in my mind, let me do it, in my mind, you got to get to a place in your mind and your heart where you could care less about what the report says you are or are not. God can do a whole lot with you when you don't care about what people say and what communities have diagnosed you with. When you get to a moment and a place in your life where you only care what God through Christ can do for you and not what people say about you, you are almost there, honey. And that's essentially what's required to be used by God to not care about cultural remedies. This woman presses. There's a crowd already around him being selfish and self-centered, but she presses. She presses because the crowd can't do anything for her. When you have tried the crowd's way long enough, you will push past them. When you've tried people and their petty ways because you want it to be accepted by them and they have rejected you because they are insecure, 
about what you can do, then you will press beyond them. She pressed beyond them. Press, get on past the crowd, not being distracted. And she said to herself, this is what her, here is how we learn what's on her mind. Was she thinking about what they would say? Was she thinking about how they would treat her? No, she said, if I can touch the hem, old school, if I can touch the clothing he's wearing, I know I'll be made well. I need to say this, right here is important. It's important for everybody, including this preacher that God is speaking and using in this moment. You got to have a mindset, yes, but you got to have a vocabulary. You got to have a kind of communicative language with yourself that says what I need is in the hands of my God. You got you to gotta have it before you go in and ask the bank for one dime. You got to believe in the power of God's ability to mess up the banker's mind, convict the banker's heart to the point where they have to call you and give you the break you need. Can, can I make it live? Can I, can I, can I make it live? Let me see. That, 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 I heard this. I heard this. And I want to make it live for you. That was a. A young man who wants, no, no, I don't, I don't want to tell that one. I'm going to save that, put a pin there. Let me, that was a college student who was attending an HBCU in Virginia. Maya, Virginia Union to be exact, that other school. And while he was there, I want to be clear. What time is it? Okay, I got to get out. I've been rolling 20 minutes. While he was there, he ran out of money. It was his senior year. And he didn't have sufficient funds to finish his senior year. He had fell in love his freshman year and dated his freshman and sophomore and junior year and decided to get married. And in his senior year, his wife and newborn child were in need of what he could not provide because his financial aid had run out. And he was almost done. And he was a straight A student, had a 4.0 GPA. But he went to the president of Virginia Union at that time and said, I'm going to have to drop out of school. President says, why? He says, because my money has gotten so funny. It, it's even it's not strange. It's just funny. It's not there. And I don't have anything to pay for college this semester. President said, do you believe in God? He said, I do. Are you a Christian? He said, I am. He said, well, God can work this thing out. He said, I don't see it, Miss President. The president said, let's pray about this. He prayed about it, and then the young man started crying in the middle of the prayer. The president said, now, Lord, you're able to do what no other power can do. And you're able to make ways that no other way can be made. Hear us, Lord, the president said. Hear our prayer and work this out for this young man. Amen. Young man got up, hugged the president of Virginia Union at the time, and walked out the door, wiping his eyes, still wondering how it would be done. But the president was believing in God for a miracle. At that moment of believing in God, the president said, the phone rang in his office. The secretary said, there's a gentleman on the phone who wants to speak with you. He said, okay. He picked up the phone. Hello. He said, is this... Sam Proctor. He said, this is, are you the Sam Proctor that went to college all oh, 25 years ago and received a scholarship from a particular man? He said, yes, and I've been honest trying to reach this man for years because I wanted to thank him because without him, I would not have made it. And the older man said to him on the, the voice of the other end of the phone said, I am he, and I'm so proud of you. He said, I thank you. I couldn't thank you, but I thank you because without you, I wouldn't have finished. And now he said, you are the president of the college. He said, yes, I am. The older gentleman who was older said, well, I'm, I'm dying. I won't be around much longer. And what I need for you to do is I want to bless as many people as I can before I leave here. I gave you a scholarship. And do you know 
any student who is in need of a scholarship right now. The president, Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, threw his hands up in his office and said, I got somebody that just ran out of my office crying. Hold on. Come here for a minute. You, you got to get to a point where you believe that somehow God through Christ will work it out in ways that nobody else can so understand nor saw. Well, God, we'll do it. There are enough of us in this room that can testify. There are enough of us listening and looking that can testify that the Lord will make the way somehow. The woman pressed, said, if I can just touch his clothing. That's the language she used, I'll be made whole. I got to ask on this Sunday morning, what is your language sounding like? How do you talk about what God can do to your problems? How are you sharing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you can ask or imagine? How, how are you dealing with your language? In order to have a personal encounter with Jesus the Christ, you got to watch your language as you press through the crowd. Don't allow the crowd's language to become your language. Don't allow pessimism and negative and criticism and all of that negative energy to become on your language. You got to press, but you got to not be distracted by other stuff. You got to trust. Like this woman said, if I can touch the hem of his garment. I'm going home. I've been up too long. Let's get out of here. Can we come back next week if it's the Lord's will? And can I finish this? We're just getting started and it's been so good and I got to shut it down. The woman says if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well or whole, whatever your version says. She's got faith. Wait, pastor, she don't know him personally. Woo. Who said you had to know him personally in order for you to believe in his power? Who said you had to be a Christian to believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you ask? Who said you had to be a member of a congregation? Who said you had to have it all together in order to believe, have mercy, that God's power is available and able to do for you what no other power can do. That's the problem. You think the power of God is tied to the preferences of others that have told you what you need to do. You think it's tied to a credit report. You think it's tied to your education. You think it's tied to your age, your color, your ethnicity, your sexuality, your gender. Honey, that's what's wrong with America. Caught up in thinking gender and sexuality are more important than whether you believe God has made you well. Come here. The minute you turn your attention from all of that foolishness is the moment you realize that God never needed you to do anything but believe in his power. She believes in the power and she understands something that most of us Christians do not. I'm done. She understands family that Jesus is the person who is introducing the world to the power of God. She understands that Jesus is the vehicle that God is operating through to get God's love to, and healing and deliverance to people. She understands that Jesus is the way to God. Woo. Do you understand that Jesus is how God is going to work in your stuff? Do you understand that trusting in Jesus is how God is going to take non-believers who sit in high places and get them to call your name? Do you understand that God is going to work through Christ to open doors that believers and people who say they're Christians will not want open in your life? 
You got to believe in his power through Jesus. If I can touch the hem of his garment, get out of here, let's go. If I can touch the hem of his garment, I wish I had an organist in here. If I can touch a little bit of him, somehow, some way, he's done it for others. I suspect, no, I'm convinced, no, I'm certain, no, hey, I am sure that he's going to do it through me and for me. I said this earlier, I'm shutting it down here with this story. There was once a little boy who had gone to church and heard preachers preach for years about the power of God. He'd heard old preachers tune up and say, he's a bread in a starving land. He'd heard old preachers say, he is a water when you are thirsty. He'd heard old preachers say, he'll be a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He heard him say, he's a battle axe in the time of battles. And he just recalled those stories. He recalled them on one occasion when he had heard his mother and father say that they had run out and they had run out of money and had no money for groceries. So he decided, this little boy decided that he would write Jesus a letter. Took his pencil, wrote the letter and said, dear Mr. Jesus, my family is in need of you. We need you. My daddy has lost his job. My mama has lost her job. And we are without bread and we are without milk and we are without food and we are without clothing and the heat is not working and it's cold. And the little boy wrote and folded it up, put it in an envelope he found on his father's table wrote on the outside of the envelope for God and Jesus, sealed it and put a stamp on it and put it in the mailbox and went to school that day. The mailman came by, got the letter, looked at it because it didn't see an address. It just said to God and Jesus and the curiosity of the cat must have got the mailman because he opened the mail. He opened the letter. And as he opened it, he began to read, Dear Mr. Jesus, my family needs you. And, and tears began to swell up in the mailman's eyes. And he went on. And as he was reading it, people were speaking to the mailman, but he was so into the letter that they said, that's not like him. So they stopped him and asked him, why are you crying? And he said, listen, look at this. He passed the letter to a baker on the same street. The baker read it, started crying. The baker got the letter and passed it to the milkman. The milkman got it, started crying, and passed it to the grocery store owner. The grocery store owner got it, started reading, and passed it to the clothing store. And, and, and before you know it, all along the strip, this letter had been passed about this family. Nobody slept that night. Bad man got up the next morning, in the middle of the morning, they say, went to the bakery and started baking. Milkman came by, started gathering milk. Grocery store man couldn't sleep that night, told his wife about it. And they went over after midnight, opened the store and started putting food in bags. Mailman got himself together. Him and his wife got together. Decided they had been saving a little money, took some of what they had been saving, put it in an envelope and said, we better head over to the house. The next morning when daddy got up to say his prayers, mama got up to join him in praying. They heard rattling and feet stepping off of their porch. Daddy got up, went out to look, 
bag, porch full of bags, milk, grocery, envelopes full of money. Mail mailman said, he stood there and said, I, I read your son's letter to Jesus. And we've all decided to pitch in. Family had enough food to survive for the rest of the month. Come here for a minute. You can't tell me what God won't do. You can't tell me that God won't move. I'll close it this way. God moves in mysterious ways. His wonder to perform. You better trust God through Christ Jesus. You better work to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I'll see you next week. My soul is happy. I'll see you next week to finish this up. But I just want you to try Jesus and have a personal encounter with him. And guess what? We hadn't even dealt with it. We're just dealing with what she got to deal with before she met him. I hope you've been blessed this morning. I pray that you were not kept too long. I hope you enjoyed it. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. It's my prayer and I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.